Is it a good idea to learn how to use Excel macros? Well, if you would like to automate repetitive and routine tasks, Excel macros are the perfect tool for that job and they can do it all in one click. Imagine receiving this data set on a daily basis and you would normally go through a series of steps to transform that data into something that looks a little bit more readable and presentable. Rather than doing this same task over and over, if you record the steps once with an Excel macro, the next time and every other time, you will only need to click once and the work is done. That is what Excel macros is all about. Let's have a look. Before we start recording a macro, it's always useful to add the developer tab to your Excel ribbon. We can add this by right clicking anywhere on the ribbon and then choose customize ribbon. On the right hand side, you can see all of the ribbon tabs and currently the developer tab is unchecked. So let's include this and click OK. So now we've got the developer tab on our Excel ribbon. The great thing about adding the developer tab is that we'll only ever need to add it once. It's not just unique to this workbook. Anytime you open Excel in the future, the developer tab will automatically be available to you as we have added it now. So we've got four main sections in this tab. For recording our macros, we're really only interested in the group on the left called code. If we want to start recording a macro, all we need to do is click on this record macro button. This launches a dialog box where Excel asks us to give our macro a name. Let's call this one formatting. We can also assign a shortcut to this macro. I'm going to hold down the shift key and then the F key. So my macro is assigned to the shortcut control shift F. Be a little careful when you're assigning shortcuts to macros because they will override the default Excel shortcuts. If you're used to saving your document with the shortcut control S, for example, and then you assign that to a macro, the macro shortcut will become the action Excel executes with control S, and it will forget about the default action, which it is to save a workbook. You can also choose where to store this macro and give it a description. Let's leave these as they are for now and click OK. From this point on, Excel is going to watch every single step we make and it's going to turn all of these steps into code in the background. Before you start recording any steps, it's good to have a think about the steps that will get you to the solution and then only execute those steps. We don't really want the macro to be executing a whole series of unnecessary steps. But also don't worry too much if you make a couple of additional steps along the way. First, I want to select cell A1, even if it's already selected. And then I'm going to use the shortcut control A so that my entire data set becomes active. On the home tab, I'm going to change the font to Calibra. And I'm also going to change the size of the font to be 10. Let me zoom in a little bit so we get a clearer version of the display. The first thing I want to do here is to format the invoice, the paid amount and the balance amount as currency. So I will select the first three cells and then press the shortcut control shift down. It's important to record your steps in the same way you want Excel to execute them in the future. When we use the shortcut control shift down, we're telling Excel to select everything in our data set beneath the first row, rather than selecting a fixed static range with our mouse. By doing this, the next time we run our macro, it won't matter if our data set contains 20 rows or 20,000 rows. Everything in the data set will be selected. I'm going to press control one to open the format cells dialog box then format the cells as currency with no decimal place and we'll format the negative numbers as red within brackets. You will remember that the target output we want contains a column called status, telling us if each customer account has a payment overdue, it's fully paid or if the customer has available credit. We don't seem to have that column in our raw data, so let's add a column called status. 
we're going to need to write an if function to return the text status values. So let's say that if the balance is less than zero, then our function should return the value of payment overdue. We're going to need another if statement here and say that if the balance is greater than zero, then the customer account has available credit. In all of the cases where the balance is equal to zero, we can get the function to return the value of fully paid. Let's go ahead now and use the autofill handle to fill down this formula to all of the rows. We also want to apply conditional formatting to this column. The range we're interested in is already selected, so we can go ahead and navigate to conditional formatting and in the highlight cells rule section, choose the equal to rule. Let's first take care of the formatting for payment overdue. We can let this be formatted with light red fill and dark red text. Let's repeat that, but this time let's take care of available credit. We can type available credit in the box and then we can set this to be green fill with dark green text. And we can leave the fully paid status without formatting. Let's place a border to our header by selecting cell A1 and then pressing Control Shift right. We can press Control 1 again to open the Format Cells dialog box and navigate to the Border tab. I would like a blue border for the header with a thicker line style and I'm only interested in formatting the bottom border so I can go ahead and confirm. And our last step will be to sort this data set based on the remaining balance from smallest to largest. Let me select cell A1 and then use the shortcut Control A so that the entire data is selected, then I'm going to navigate to the data tab and choose sort. The sort dialog box appears, so let's tell Excel that we want to sort based on the column called balance, and we want to sort from smallest to largest. And finally, let's just resize all of the columns within our worksheet so our display looks okay. So that's it. We have recorded all of the necessary steps. Now that the macro has finished recording, we can go back to the developer tab and again in the code group, click on stop recording macro. If we go to the next tab of our workbook, we can see that there is a similar raw data set. If we want to run the macro we just recorded on this data set, in the developer tab, we can click on the macros button. We can see the macro that we just recorded called formatting. Let's select this macro and then click run. And just like that, all of the steps that we recorded previously by the macro have been re-executed on this new worksheet. You will also remember that we assigned a shortcut to this macro, which was Control shift f If I go to this next tab, which also contains raw data, and then use the shortcut Control shift f the macro gets executed and all the formatting steps are applied. So macros can be great, but they can't do everything. And sometimes we need to be a little bit careful when using macros, as they may not always give us the desired result. And knowing where to slightly edit the recorded macro code can come in really handy. To show you an example of this, let's consider one other short example. We want to record a macro that will combine these January, February and March data sets and display one combined data set on this master worksheet tab. Let's start off by clicking the recorded macro button in the developer tab. Let's call this macro combine. We can leave all of the other inputs and just click OK. Let's select the January worksheet and then select cell A2. We can select our range using the shortcut Control shift right and Control shift down then use Control c to copy. Go back to the master worksheet and then paste this information into cell A2 using the shortcut Control v Let's press Control down and then down again so that Excel navigates to the bottom of the data set and then moves down one cell so that it's ready for the next data set to be pasted. We can go to the February data set and select all of the data. Let's copy again and go back to the master worksheet and paste the February data with the shortcut Control v Let's again use Control and the down arrow followed by the down arrow again. And now we can go back to the March worksheet. Let's select the data and then copy. 
finally, we can go back to the master sheet and I will paste this data at the bottom of the existing data set. So we finished recording all of the steps. Let's click stop recording. I'll delete all of this data so we can now see how our macro performs. Let's click on macros and we can see our macro called combine. Let's run this. It's worked as expected and all the data has been combined. Let's just remove all of this data quickly. But now let's go into the January data set and remove one of the rows. What do you think is going to happen this time when we run the macro? Do you think the macro will perform perfectly or will there be a problem? Let's go back to the master data sheet and then in the developer tab, let's click on macros. Let's select our combined macro and click run. Okay, so we don't exactly get the desired result here. And to understand why, let's have a look at the code. There may be some minor adjustments that we can make to ensure our macro runs a little better. When we recorded our macro, Excel wrote code in the background. If we want to view that code, we can click on the macros button in the developer tab, select our macro and then click edit. This launches the VBA code interface where we can see all of the code that is executed when our macro runs. The reason our code hasn't run as expected is because after the data set is pasted into the master sheet, we press control down to move to the bottom of the data set and then we use the down arrow to move down one more cell. The recorded code to move to the bottom of the data set looks okay, it's dynamic. We can see it's considering the active selection and then moving down to the end. However, the next selection is referring to a fixed cell. This is why we get a gap in our data, as cell A6 is being selected rather than cell A5, which is what we expect before the February dataset is pasted. We can replace this fixed selection with a dynamic selection using active cell dot offset and then offsetting one row and zero columns, followed by the select method. This is also the case after the second data set is pasted. We can see that our code moves down to the end of the selection, but then the reference again is fixed. So we can copy and paste this one line of code which we have written over the fixed selection reference. If you know a little bit of VBA code, it can be relatively easy for you to identify where the problematics are within the code and edit them. The majority of the time, they can be due to these fixed references. If you're interested to learn all about macros and VBA from beginner to advanced, I have a complete course available on my website. Now that we've made all the adjustments to the code we need, let's go back to Excel and delete all of the information so we can run the macro and see how it will perform. Again, click on the macros button, then choose the combine macro and click run. And perfect, that looks a lot better. There are no gaps in the data set. Finally, if you want to save an Excel file which contains macros, we have to save it as a macro enabled workbook. You will notice if you try and save your workbook, Excel will give you a warning message telling you that your workbook contains a VB project, or in other words, VBA code. If you click yes, Excel will delete all of the VBA code from your file and save it as a normal Excel workbook. However, if you want to save your workbook with your newly recorded macro, click on no, and then from the drop down, you're going to want to select Excel macro enabled workbook or a dot XLSM file, and then you can go ahead and click save. So macros are pretty useful. We can let the computer do all the hard work so we can save time, avoid mistakes and improve efficiency. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about macros and VBA code, feel free to check out my comprehensive course on macros and VBA. Don't forget to hit that like button if you liked what you saw and subscribe to the channel. If there are any other topics that you would like to learn, feel free to leave a comment down below. And as always, have a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you next time.